to lie this spring. I've brought you together because I think you guys might be able to solve this case. Former guy who used to run the British government's UFO project (laughs) does what many respected UFO researchers before him have done. Only better. Everything we've tried before has not worked. We've done it the MOD way. Now we're going to try it my way. Sell out. The Nick Pope way. Starring hypnotist Cum Chumley. My name's Cum Chumley and I've been a hypnotist in a Tijuana donkey show for well over 20 years. I have, I have. Mecca lecca hi. Mecca hi ni ho. What language are you speaking? Sleep. 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 Also starring a psychic Cienze. It's hard to bring something new to investigations, but as far as me now, a CNC ain't never been used what to investigate nothing before. Which race crashed at Roswell? That's the racer. <laughs> Further starring Giorgio Sucalos's hair. Giorgio Sucalos's hair. I want you to read the historic records of all mankind to find out precisely when aliens first landed on Earth. You think you can do that for me? Good. Then I want you to start in Turkey. Turkey says. Not that kind of turkey, psychic and say. Can you believe even further starring? An emo douche? Whatever. Yup, that's all it's st- Oh, and also starring as the star of the show. Star Nick Pope. Something is going on. Something unusual. Something interesting. Who knows about it? Right, who knows any fucking thing? You don't understand. I'm out of here. Sell out. The Nick Pope way. A movie so convoluted, we don't even know the case we're investigating. Or if it's a movie. Is it a movie? A TV show? Fuck. Won't you join me, Nick Pope, on the trip of a lifetime to the bank? No, 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 no. Jeff, if I'm making weird sound effects, that can only mean one thing. It's our 100th episode. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. That's pretty landmark. That's uh, that's triple digits. That's a lot of work. Yeah, I don't know what the hell happened. It's like, uh, you know, first we had Whitley on and and then I blinked and now this. <laughs> not not really. No, no, <laughs> not really. Uh, uh, well, yeah. but thankfully we have uh, we have a great guest to crack the hundredth. Uh, Absolutely. So that fell into our laps rather nicely. And that would be, of course, one Dr. Raymond Moody. Should I read from his list of accomplishments? I think you should. All right. Raymond Moody, MD, PhD, a forensic psychiatrist and the father of the near-death experience, so says the New York Times, has been at the forefront in researching these topics and writing and speaking about them. His latest book is about shared death experiences, which are deathbed visions that are witnessed by bystanders as well as the person who is dying. Dr. Raymond Moody is the leading author on these topics, and now he shares his groundbreaking study into shared death experiences in glimpses of eternity, sharing a loved one's passage from this life to the next. Uh, That's his new book. Glimpses of Eternity. Right. Yes. So I I just think it's phenomenal that we uh, decided to make the turn into near-death experiences. And our very first guest on our very 100th episode is, in fact, the the father of the term near-death experience. The Cadillac of the NDE. (laughs) That's right. Um, But before we get to him, did, uh, did anything of note occur in the last week or so? I believe we uh, debuted a magazine. No, that's right. How did that go? Or a preview. I think it went rather well, actually. Yes. We launched it at, what, around midnight on Friday? Uh, Yeah. And by 1 p.m. Saturday, um, the fit had hit the shan. I don't think um, there's been a more, I don't know, controversial or 
uh, beneficial in a take your medicine sort of way to ufology launch of a magazine <laughs> <laughs> prior well, to Well, I mean, you know, it's um it, it's it, I mean, it's it's pretty much the the swan song of you know uh, of of what we've been able to find out and what we've been able to bring to this uh this whole discussion or debate uh, uh about the validity of this kind of work. I mean, I think that pretty much sums it up and uh, you know, as I said to you before, I mean, I don't what more can you say, do, show, speak to, interview? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, I think the Carol Rainey's article was very well written. And despite some of the things that are being said about it, in other words, you know, the scorned wife, this sort of thing, you know, it just becomes really apparent to me in real short order that most of these comments are coming from people who haven't read the article. Uh, because yeah, and let's be you know. really clear too about this: uh, the overwhelming majority of anything we've heard um, in email or phone call mm-hmm. from, and we're talking the top names in ufology. Oh yes, the top names in ufology has been completely positive to the extent of, yeah, we sort of figured this. In fact, we don't think you went far enough, Carol. <laughs> right, right. That's correct. Yeah. So yeah. no matter what you hear from schmucks on message boards, it's like, no, 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 no. That's not what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah. Well, I mean, how would the schmucks on the message board feel to, you know, to, to know that some of their most respected uh, ufological heroes have been essentially agreeing with Miss Rainey um, and thanking her for writing the article? I mean, you know, I, I think it takes a lot of guts to do what she did. Uh, just like everyone else who's who's spoken uh, about this and about their encounter with it, um, that the whole scenario has just been uh, uh, a real up and down for all of this stuff. And to do so in her position, where she knew out of the gate that people would think, "Oh, you know, scorned wife, hell hath no fury, etc., cetera, etc.," cetera, and did it anyway. Because it was the right thing to do, and she felt compelled to do it um, with everything else that's been going on in that field lately. So, you know. yeah. Well, and let's be clear too. I mean, we'll, we'll cover all this when we have uh, Carol on. Yes. Um, but just to to be clear, I mean, when you say "Oh, hell hath no fury" and all that sexist stuff, I mean, that's all that is is sexism. It is. It has nothing to do with the article, and um, you know, it's not like we're dummies. You know, like we may make jokes and stuff like that, but. At the end of the day, uh, you don't just publish an article like this without doing due diligence, and um, everything that can be backed up is backed up. I've seen her documentation. I have seen her documentary footage. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if you don't read the article and you just go by what some – I don't know what the right word is. I want to say idiots, but I think it's actually a concerted uh, misinformation campaign by not idiots uh, who mm-hmm. want to keep the field as it is. Um but whatever the case is, if you listen to the people who are just saying, well, this is this is tabloid journalism, this is a scorned woman, this is this, that, they have not read the article or they have and they're lying because uh, there's nothing in there that is uh, that. No, I mean, it certainly doesn't. Factual. <laughs> right. I mean, she doesn't get into you know any of their marital uh, you know issues, which frankly is no one's business anyway, but – uh, everything that's in there, I mean, 16 footnotes, uh, I, you know, and I read it countless times laying it out. And it, um, you know, this is definitely not that sort of article. And it's not that sort of, um, it, it's not even that sort of tone. I mean, this is very, I was there, I witnessed this, and here's what I saw. I mean, you know, that that's it in a nutshell. And, and um you know, and again, I've I've encountered a couple of people on message boards the past couple of days that um, I, I think were wholly unaware of the entire upheaval in this little corner of the field, and um, I'm amazed to see that some people like won't even listen to the Lillenfeld episode and want to engage in a conversation about this. And I just go, look, you need to listen to this episode. This will lay or set the stage for you into what we're talking about. And all of this that's come after has been the result of the pathway towards, you know, that sort of, of, of thing. And I'm shocked at, at the amount of people that just want to keep going 
and won't do the simple <laughs> the simple out of listening to the program. It's free for Christ's sakes. Well, Listen you know what I think it. part of it is is yeah. um you know, we're so used to not dealing with these really cut and dry factual nuts and bolts sort of things that we want to pretend that everything's up in the air and we've got a valid opinion about everything and and so I think when you get into that mode with all of this esoteric stuff, when something comes along that has been answered right. as has hypnosis, which I didn't know until I looked into it, you know, mm-hmm. um, thanks to you. So, but when you do, it's all right there. And it's like, oh, Eureka. No, there actually are myriad um, tests that all point to the same results, you know, that – right. You know, and people want to point to like, well, you know, I mean, I think we mentioned this on the show. It's like, well, what about Dr. Simon with the hills? And it's like, but that was, I mean, how, how many decades was that ago? I mean, the, the information has changed. The people know more now than they did back then. You know what I mean? It's like, duh. So if you just follow the actual science, and I think that's something people don't want to do, um, because they want everything to be an open ended, question where it doesn't need to be because that's just where we're used to well you know what i i don't i see i don't even know if it if it exists in that kind of fashion i mean i think it, it, for the past you know god knows how many years we've seen ufology kind of close itself off from people who could potentially help because i think ufology sees everyone on the outside of ufology with any sort of alphabetical um, you know, uh, abbreviation after their name as, wow, this is someone who could level something that actually destroys the work we're doing. And I think there's been this, uh, whether it's conscious or subconscious, I think it's been this pullback. And so anytime you tell someone, look, look outside of this and look what people outside of this field are saying about this, and they are the ones who are actually educated in this. Uh, and not a UFO researcher. I mean, this dire cutoff uh, it has really been a lot of what's been detrimental to this field is we shut out what we don't want to hear because we immediately think anyone outside of this with any kind of educational authority is going to be a debunker. And that's, as we found with some of the guests on this show, is clearly not the case. There are people interested in this. There are people interested in digging into it that are not, uh, uh, I would say, oversaturated with their educational dogma to just immediately dismiss it. And, you know, and so you know that's that's where you could go with that. Is just to say we've been so cut off that people don't even know that uh, you know that that alternate opinions exist that don't necessarily completely destroy. Uh, y- your your work or your thought, and then there's some that do, and we've got to explore both of those. Right. Yeah, and then of course the other thing that we've seen um, by way of detracting, I guess, is just well, this is it. This is the fuel that the debunkers need. This is the end. You know, now that uh, it's like, you know, I'll do <laughs> don't a little. Get me started. <laughs> I'll do a vlog about some of this. I'm sure we'll talk about it next week in depth. But, you know, the thing that, that I've been saying was amazing about the Emma Woods thing is, look at this. Isn't this amazing that experiencers, I mean, I said this in the article, that experiencers are the ones exposing this stuff. Right. Um, and so debunkers and, you know, professional skeptics, let's say, uh, can't hide behind, uh, oh, this points to a psychological conclusion or this points to just purely bad research and there's no – there's no phenomenon there. Um, no, no. And and I would – I guess I, I'm, I'm now formulating the argument that it's all a cottage industry. And so if they wanted to do that, they could have done that before. If, if a skeptic wanted to um, have come up with this type of work or even George Hansen's work on the Linda Cortilli case, they could have done so. And the reason they don't uh, is that th- this is their profession. <laughs> and so they need, well, some, yeah. they need stuff to rail against. So they're actually part of the problem. I think I would make that argument. Well, I mean, it's it's just like you know what I saw written by uh, a ufologist or pe- someone interested, obviously, in ufology in, in some way. Uh, that this is not only uh, a, a big blow to abduction research in general, this whole thing, but it's also uh, giving, like you said, skeptics the fuel to dismiss all of this and give abductees or experiencers a harder time than they already have. 
And so my answer to that is, okay, so we should just live in uh, delusion land because that's where it's comfortable and they can't get at us. That's better? <laughs> I mean, how is that better? I, I don't understand that kind of mentality. That absolutely floored me when I saw that coming from someone who, you know, obviously is, is, uh, is interested in the UFO field in the positive sense. Uh, I just I couldn't believe that. I, th- I thought, well, well, there it is. It's 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 about winning an argument against skeptics. It's not about what is this really? Where is it coming from? What could it mean? How do we get better questions? None of that. It's all about. Well, now we're screwed because now they've got the uh, they've got the bullet in the chamber uh, to put it in the head of this thing, and uh, there's nothing we can do about it because that's the way it is. No, no, that's not it. And, you know, just uh, I think just before I left work today, we got an an article written by uh, a skeptic where it's like, oh, yes, we've already known this and blah, blah, blah. And well, okay, where you been? Uh, Because like like Jeremy just said, I don't see where any any professional skeptic organization nor singular uh, Superman skeptic has taken this on and figured it out. Uh, I haven't seen it. uh, but the uh, you know the the other part of it for me is that, and I knew this was coming, and we all knew this was coming, is that because the hypnotic regression has uh, taken it on the chin, that means that the entire experiencer experience is kaput, and that is simply not true, and that's not even what this is about. Uh, this is about. You know, a, a incredibly flawed tool in the hands of people unqualified to even delve into that area. And, you know, and basically the palette that it's been painted with for so many years uh, is incorrect. Uh, that's that's the problem. Well, here's what I want to say that we to, don't really know what this is. Here's what and, I would say to any of the ufologists and any of the message board, um, you know, writers or whatever, chimers in, mm-hmm. um, who uh, are either trashing it without reading it or uh, saying this is going to lead to the end of our argument or whatever. Um, we're talking about people's lives in people's minds. These are right. real human beings who are going through some real shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, where's your humanity, man? I mean... <laughs> Let's get our priorities straight, you know? Like, w- w- at the end of the day, I mean, just sit down and stop and think about what you're defending. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry if some of your ideologies and your work and all that stuff is smashed, but really tough shit because uh, lives have been ruined, <laughs> for one. Um, and I-, I just think it's abysmal that two women step forward and we see them get the same treatment, you know? In oh, yeah. Completely different situations. One's an alleged experiencer or thinks she is and she goes and try for help. And the other one is the ex-wife and they both get painted with that same, unfortunately not a unicorn brush, but no, no. painted with that same, you know, Oh, well, there's always got to be some sexual thing. Either the, the jilted ex lover as people supposed Emma was wrongly, or, um, you know, the jilted ex wife as they suppose Carol is wrongly. Mm-hmm. Um, well, there's always anything, gonna be, anything yeah. to not deal with the fact of the matter. Right. Exactly. Um, but they don't want to deal with the fact of the matter because it hurts uh, the way they think it hurts their ideology. But what they're not getting is that beyond that ideology are human beings who are being hurt by this bad research because these are human research subjects, human research subjects that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So really think about it in these terms and just stop, just stop and think about it. Think about it. That's all I ask. (laughs) And also, I mean, it's just funny, too. It's like, you know, especially this one message board where clearly the host uh, is just purely not paying attention to any of this stuff or saying that it's not important or brushing it aside or saying uh, jilted X, blah, blah, blah. Hell hath no fury. We've got to keep that in mind purely because we're involved. And if we were friends with this show, you bet your ass we would be on that show right now talking about it. And he'd be like, oh, this is great stuff, guys. Great work. Clap, clap, clap. So for him, it's <laughs> not point. even about anything other than us You know, in, uh, in that sense. You know what I mean? And if anyone thinks that that's not true, you're out of your mind. <laughs> 
Yeah, good so point. So what is that about? What is that about? I mean, think of just everybody stop and think that there's humans involved here, people. Well, because it's it's again, it's all about winning the war. It's all about the fight, the conflict, which let's face it, you know, 90% of the message boards out there that you look at, what are people doing when it comes to this subject? They're insulting each other, they're fighting. And I've talked about the reasons I think some of that happens, but you know, ultimately I think This attracts a lot of heavy, heavy debate and especially debate in a field where, you know, belief systems, you know, almost have transcended into a religious, you know, kind of viewpoint. And that's that's where a lot of that fervor comes from when you're talking about art. Are you not allowed to have an informed debate? Because to me, this is like this is like the typical American dumb is cool. Well, ufological style. (laughs) What you book learned people are part of the conspiracy man yeah <laughs> like yeah. no dude we just studied some stuff and found out and you can too well yeah and see and that's just it if you I, I if hope you, that doesn't cramp your style to learn before you speak <laughs> well no i again it's it's i don't want to hear that i don't want to hear that because that see and, and this is what a lot of people aren't getting about this is that whatever hypnotic recall regression has done in this field and whatever framework or brickwork that it laid in the beginning that's been built upon and that's not only been built upon in ufological circles in the research circles but it's also been built upon in the populace as far as a belief system goes so you're talking about pulling out the cornerstone nobody wants that because then we got to start building all over again and and unfortunately at least for me and this is strictly my viewpoint only at this point, hearing from the professionals that we have, reading uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Coke John's uh, you know article in in the quarterly, looking at all of that, it's not a question of, well, what's your opinion? You, you follow what I'm saying? Here a while back, there was a a message uh, group that I was on on emails and uh, with, with with some of the biggest uh, names in this field. And there came a photograph, and and I said, yeah, clearly this is not what it appears to be. Uh, you know, clearly what you're seeing are digital artifacts. Blah 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 blah. And this person wanted to argue the point. I said, what do you do for a living? Wouldn't answer. I said, well, clearly you're not versed in imaging, because these are common artifacts that I see all the time. Um, and then somebody piped in and said, well, clearly enough's been presented on both sides that everyone on this board is free to make up their own minds or develop their own opinions. And I said, you don't seem to understand. This isn't about opinion. This is about what is and what is not. (laughs) Uh, You know, and for me, this whole issue has come down to what is and what is not. Uh, You know, there, there doesn't, I don't see an opinion to be made here. I see it as, wow, look what's going on the past umpteen million years in this field that now we're finding isn't worth a damn. I mean, that's it. Uh, so, yeah, the cornerstone is being pulled out. But, you know, God, look at that from the sense of you had a, you, you had a faulty building code here to begin with, uh, and now it's time to get serious and start really looking at this uh, in different ways, from different viewpoints, and start building some kind of foundation that can be leaned up against without somebody you know, going, oh, wait a minute, don't lean too hard on that part because it'll fall off. I mean, I, I can't understand uh, that if people care enough to be so deeply involved in this and put so much of their um, I- emotional investment in a subject like this, why they don't care enough to want to know that 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 this has been incorrect, uh, suspect at best, and uh, dangerous at worst. I mean, that, that for me ends the story right there. It's time to start rebuilding this thing up and start exploring new venues and how to explore the experience or phenomena. Yeah. I mean, you say what this thing isn't to where you can, and that's mm-hmm. what we've done. And now you move on and trying to figure out, well, okay, what is it? Right. And so... That's what we're going to do right now <laughs> with Dr. Raymond Moody. We're going to go in a whole different direction yeah. of seeing what links there are uh, in near-death experience. And, you know, it's interesting um, 
there have been studies of comparing near death experience to alien abduction, but I'd have to go back now and look at them. Kenneth Ring wrote a book about it, and I'd have to go back now and see. Well, did he base it on hypnotically retrieved testimony or not? Uh, would would those um, similarities stand up mm-hmm. if you took out the hypnotically retrieved testimony? I think they probably would in different ways. Um, like in just in reading uh, Moody's book, you know, certainly. People hear whirring sounds and buzzing mm-hmm. sounds and the room goes weird. I mean, it's the same stuff that we hear from uh, experiencers. It's the same stuff we hear with the onset of a DMT trip. Um, yeah. Everybody, when you're listening to this interview, keep other shows we've done in the back of your head. And I think you're going to find a really interesting correlation with uh, a subject that we've talked about multiple times before on the show. Yeah. So, and I, well, let's just, uh, let's do the show. Let's onward and upward, and uh, we'll come back and we'll talk about it uh, when we're done chatting up Dr. Raymond Moody. Paratopia, without further ado, please welcome to the program, you know him, you love him, Dr. <laughs> he, he, he loves being called Dr. Uh, Raymond Moody. Raymond, thank you very much for coming on the show and for being um, our very first guest about near-death experience. I mean, who better than you to talk about near-death experience? You coined the oh, term. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I am curious, too, about what you guys do. It's like what the – I haven't heard the show before, so what um, what your particular interest is and so Well, on. we're debunkers, and we're here to tear you apart. Oh, <laughs> no, great. Oh, no, no, no. That's good, because I am the ultimate debunker. <laughs> well, it, it's interesting because you called me this morning and you asked if I read utopian books, which I don't, mm-hmm. or utopian mm-hmm. literature, uh, because you're not a fan. And I thought that was kind of interesting. It was like, do you read utopian books? Is that what you called yourselves, Paratopia? Because if so, <laughs> I don't like utopia. It's like, <laughs> yeah, well, no, what I was talking about is that I have since college, I've been fascinated with the idea, uh, not with the practice, but I just sort of think of it as more of a... Um, mode of literature, and as you guys may know, I um, before I went to medical school, I got a PhD in philosophy, and I was a philosophy professor for a while. And uh, you know, Plato, I suppose, was the original utopian um, thinker, mm-hmm. and he is still my favorite philosopher overall. Mm-hmm. Well, I I actually uh, have some questions in terms of your background as it relates to your work with near-death experiences or your experiences with near-death experiences. I mean, Mm -hmm. maybe uh, we'll just jump in with a deeper question here, uh, which is, do you think that your background um, and who you are as a person plays a role in in what you've experienced and how this information has come to you? In other words, um, you talk in your book, Glimpses of Eternity, of having a shared near-death experience with your mother and some other people in the room. And then you say after that experience, suddenly people started coming to you left and right with these shared death experiences. So do you think that there is some sort of, I don't know, uh, odd uh, doling out of information from wherever this comes from, whatever source this comes from to you? You think that there is a reason that a man that is as open to this and as educated as you are is the person who's doing this? You know, I do think there is a certain, um, yeah, like a coming together of elements from my background that make me a pretty good person to investigate this sort of thing. And and it's, but actually, it goes back a long time before my experience with my mother. I um, I did not come from a religious background, and my dad was a medic in World War II and a surgeon and the Pacific Theater, and uh, although I've sort of put this together um, later in life, because as you know, that generation didn't talk about things like this much, but um, my dad came back and I'm sure was kind of embittered by the things he saw in World War II, so fortunately for me, I was not raised a religious person, and my initial interest when I was about seven was in astronomy, which is a passion I still carry, and um, then th- throughout high school, I was assuming I would get a PhD in philosophy, I mean, in uh, astronomy, but in high school, got interested in philosophy, and then when I went to UVA in uh, 1962, intending to get my PhD in um, astronomy, uh, just within the first few days of um, 
uh, as an undergraduate, I decided I wanted to be a, ph a philosophy major, which is uh, pretty much um, still one of my major interests is primarily ancient Greek philosophy, although the area of philosophy I'm interested in is logic and um, philosophy of language. I, I was basically a logic and ancient Greek philosophy professor. And um, the way I got uh, that I became interested in these near-death experiences had to do with Plato, because um, basically when I went to college, I just to me, the idea of an afterlife was a non-starter. Um, I had decided pretty early in life when I was, uh, you know, an astronomy buff that um, when you die, your body rots and your consciousness vanishes. And um, the first time I ever had an inkling that the question of an afterlife was important was in reading um, Plato's Republic and Phaedo during my first year at UVA. Well, uh, as you may know, the Republic closes with a uh, very dramatic uh, experience of a warrior who was believed dead on the battlefield but spontaneously revived. And he talks about this uh, experience he had in the interim of going into some other domain of existence. And um, <clears throat> the being very impressed by Plato, um, he's still my favorite philosopher, um, I sort of went on through and, you know, d got a, uh, did my major in philosophy at UVA. And then my third year there in 1965, one of my philosophy professors told me that right there in Charlottesville at the medical school was Dr. George Ritchie, who was a professor of psychiatry there, who some years before had actually been pronounced dead. And um, so... Uh, and, and in the in the meantime, had this remarkable experience. So, in 1965, I heard Dr. Ritchie talk about his experience. He often talked to student groups on uh, around UVA and so on. And um, then I went on and got my PhD in philosophy. And um, in 1969, after I finished that, I became a philosophy professor for three years. And in connection with the, the reading of Plato's dialogues, I heard this kind of story quite often from my, um, my students, and that was in the period 69 to 72. And um, then when I went to medical school in 72, I already had interviewed roughly a dozen people who had been to the brink of death and had these experiences, and obviously uh, the, you know, the medical training was an opportunity to talk with lots of other people who had been to the brink of death and so on. So that's how it got started. The notion of an afterlife was really not what um, appealed to me. What has always been most interesting to me as a, a sort of general overall theme of the, um, the questions I'm interested in is what it is that makes something unintelligible. In other words, um, if you think, for example, about the question we all get into, I suppose, when we're kids about, uh, you know, how big is this thing that we're in and what shape is, is it? Well, either answer you can give, um, e either that it ends in a, um, a wall, say, at, at some vast distance, or that it goes on forever seems literally unintelligible, right? I mean, it, it doesn't make sense to say that there's some kind of wall around the universe because you can always think, well, obviously the notion of a wall implies something on the other side of the wall. And uh, similarly, the other seeming alternative, that it just goes on forever and ever, is equally unintelligible. So... Um, what really grabbed my attention about this question of an afterlife was, if you think about it, it's just a straightforward self-contradiction to say there is life after death, right? Because if you look up those words in the dictionary, death just means the, the state from which one does not return. Um, that, that, in other words, the final irreversible cessation of life. And um, so... That was the route of entree into this. I did not really start out to investigate the afterlife. I started out to investigate the question of um, 
why it is that some things that are literally unintelligible are nonetheless very, very significant questions. I, I really was convinced by Plato's argument when I was a first-year um, undergraduate student that uh, the question of life after death is, I think, the biggest question of existence. In that, mm -hmm. if there is something to it, then it, it shifts everything around, everything else around, and uh, it, it um, makes all the other big questions of existence have an entirely different um, shape to them. So that was my um, um, entree into the question. So then are we seeing then through your work that that maybe it's uh, death is less uh, annihilation and more cocoon, more coming out of the cocoon and being transformed into something else? Well, I suspect that you two have read William James and his varieties of religious experience or know about that. Mm -hmm. And um, my, my uh, attitude uh, toward this is, is pretty much the, the same as his, that there, there does seem to be, in terms of a, of a scientific verification of it, not really doesn't really seem to be in the cards um and, and um i think that um probably of all of the thinkers in the western world the two people i think that have made the best statements about the difficulty of the question of life after death are plato as i mentioned but also david hume the great um Scotch uh, skeptic who lived from 1711 to 1776, and um, Hume's statement was that it, for the logical person to think this through, what you ultimately come up with is that the, the notion of an afterlife is incommensurate with the code of logic that we used, because as I mentioned, it's a self-contradiction. And so what Hume went on to say, if I could quote him exactly, he said, by the mere light of reason, it seems difficult to prove the immortality of the soul. And then he said, some new species of logic is required for that purpose, and some new faculties of the mind that they may enable us to comprehend that logic. Now, Hume was an ironist, and it's, it's a good assumption, I think, or a plausible assumption, that probably when he made that remark, he was being ironic. And what he meant to convey by it was that really to, to give a proof of an afterlife is impossible on the face of it. But whether he was being ironical or not, he absolutely did, in my opinion, state the problem correctly, and that is that the problem is that it that the notion of an afterlife just doesn't compute by the logic that we use, not only in the scientific and academic disciplines, but also in the thinking about the affairs of our everyday lives. And um, I think that where the advance in this study is going to come is in the solution of Hume's problem. In other words, I think that it is possible now to have a code of logic, not one to replace the Aristotelian logic that we have, but rather to, um, to, to supplement it in certain cases where the, what is said is not intelligible. In other words, in the, in the case of self-contradiction or other forms of nonsensical utterance. In other words, that we need a logic of things that are unintelligible. And I do think, actually, that um, within the next few years, there, there is, I think now, a genuine rational advance toward comprehension of this question. Well, one, let, me, let me stop you there. Uh, you know, that's um, all for the big social proof, but in terms of you personally, I mean, you um, have built the psychomantium, right? Uh, yes. I read your book, Reunions. Did that work? I mean, you've had oh, it say, absolutely the sheer, does work. The it sheer does death work. experience. I mean, so you know that this stuff is real. Whatever real means, let's put that in quotes. Whatever this well, is. Well, there you go. There's, there's the there's the operative 
not, uh, you know, the notion it real. And so what does it mean to you personally, given all that you've experienced and, and studied? Well, I'll just get right to the fact, and this is, this is um, something I could only t- say to you within the last year, and, and that at all these years up to about a year ago, I just de- honestly didn't know. I had no idea. But just in the last year or so, things have sort of flowed together in such a way that um, I do begin, I am leaning toward thinking that there really is life after death. But more importantly than that, uh, more importantly than my personal opinion is the fact that um, I say this within the context of knowing in my mind that the essential logical problems have now been worked out and that not only do we have this extraordinary um, uh, number of near-death experiences, but also, as we now know for sure, that people um, who are bystanders or onlookers at the death of, of loved ones will quite frequently have this identical experience that we, when it occurs to someone who almost dies and is brought back, that we term a near-death experience, but all of the features that we know of of as the near-death experience also occurs quite commonly to people who are at the bedside of someone who does pass away. So putting that together with the fact that we now have some sort of logical framework to talk about it, and and the fact that I I think that um, with the occurrence of these um, shared death experiences that that I discussed in the book uh, I think you mentioned the glimpses of eternity um, that that occurrence kind of knocks out the simple-minded neurophysiological explanation and in, in other words if um, if if people who object to this say, well, the near-death experience, that's obviously the fact that uh, that as a person nears death and the oxygen tension diminishes, then the brain throws up this hallucinatory phenomenon. Well, then if that's the case, then why should identically the same experience be reported by people who are not ill or injured, but, but who just happen to be there when... Uh, uh, a loved one dies. And so to me, you see, it becomes very difficult to explain this away. I, basically, what I've experienced in the past year or, or two is that I became aware that when I would come try to st- say something other than on the basis of these things, that there's an afterlife, I had the distinct impression that I was running away from something and trying to rationalize rather than I, that I was just sort of taking the question face on. Because it is, it's very difficult for me to, to sound plausible, I think, um, at this point by saying any other thing that this does seem to me to add up to an indication that there's an afterlife, especially when you take it within the framework of of developments in logic. Um, And I'm not talking scientific here. I mean, in my opinion, guys, if, if somebody tells you, oh, I've got scientific evidence of life after death, I think that is an incredibly naive position and, uh, matter of fact, even ultimately an incoherent one. And um, as much as I uh, respect and love these people who call themselves the parapsychologists and so on, and and I'm not saying anything behind their back, this is exactly what I say to their face, which is that um, I think parapsychology is an outright pseudoscience. And, and that anybody who says to you that science in the year 2011 can prove or give evidence of an afterlife is either self-deluded or they're trying to fool somebody else. 
in my opinion. Sort of on that note, what do you do with ghosts and hauntings and that sort of thing? Does that fit into your your work at all? Well, you know, I have been on about two or three um, ghost investigations with an old friend of mine, Dr. Bill Roll. And um, I'll just tell you the truth. I went along with the idea of kind of rolling my eyes up, you know, thinking that, oh, that when we get there, we're going to meet very hysterical people and so on. And in the the investigations I went on, I got to say, I just, um, it, it put me into the point where all of my, my um, sort of naive assumptions of what that would be like, in other words, that it would be very hysterical people who weren't very critical or whatever, that was thoroughly um, undermined. Um, and so I, I would have to say that I don't know about hauntings, um, that I haven't really studied that or uh, that or ghosts uh, to any um, great extent. Um, but that the little bit I have done makes me think that um, the standard criticisms of it are inadequate. In other words, that doesn't mean necessarily that there really are ghosts, but rather that what you read in the so-called skeptical books about it just seems to me overdrawn right. because uh, in the cases I went to, these these people were um, far up and, you know, far, far and away uh, in the upper percentile regions of, um, you know, soundness and people of good judgment. And uh, matter of fact, one of the cases I went to, to I... Uh, I found that the the woman who uh, was experiencing the um, the haunting was actually the wife of a very renowned neuroscientist who had actually written one of the textbooks of neurosciences I, I uh, read in medical school. So you know, I mean, I I don't know about hauntings is is my general comment, it, but except to say that. Um, I am devious about the sort of standard line of so-called skeptical objections to this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's easily accounted for by hysteria or anything like that at all. Well, let me ask you uh, about the psychomantium, uh, even though that's not what your new book is about. <laughs> i I got to ask a psychomantium question because sure. uh, you've been, I, I assume, experimenting with this for a long time now. Um, mm-hmm. Could you first just tell people what it is and then... Tell us if you've learned anything. If 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 these things have spoken to you, uh, have they said anything mm. that's groundbreaking, or or you know you couldn't know on your own? Well, uh, first of all, uh, that that's a really a very pregnant question. So thank you for it, and and uh, it gives me an, another opportunity to, to interject here my my favorite subject, the ancient Greek philosophers, because uh, that's how I got interested in the in the psychomantions or uh, oracles of the dead, as as they are called. I had read about them in college in Herodotus, the ancient Greek uh, historian, and also Aristophanes, the Greek playwright uh, sort of uh, wrote about them, and Plutarch, and um, many, many other um, early Greek philosophers uh, were were involved with these uh, these institutions. And and uh, the specific interest to me was uh, uh, has to do with the fact that um, incredible as it may seem, and if you guys think that I'm making this one up, I can give you some. Uh, references where you can begin to read about it for yourself, but it turns out that logic itself uh, came here through one of these oracles of the dead, through a um, early Greek philosopher named Parmenides, who is regarded as the father of deductive logic. And um, in his day job, who was uh, uh, Parmenides, who was a pre-Socratic philosopher, worked at one of these oracles of the dead, and during one of his trips to the other world, uh, met this goddess who revealed to him the basic principle of deductive argumentation, and uh, in the form of um, a song, and. Um, 
that is how logic began. And um, so, so that was the origins of my interest in this. And since I was 18 years old, I have followed the classical literature uh, very, very closely. I mean, this is one of my favorite subjects. And um, in about 1985, I read that one of the, the, or the most famous of the oracles of the dead, which was the oracle of the dead on the Acheron River in northwest um, Greece, had recently been um, excavated. And in the excavations, what they found was the remnants of a large bronze cauldron that had been placed in this underground facility um, in such a way that indicated that when people saw these visions of their deceased relatives, they were circling this cauldron. And as soon as that I read that detail, I knew exactly what it was all about because um, I had known from other uh, readings in ancient Greek uh, literature that this was a very common knowledge among the ancient Greeks that, for example, they would uh, polish a metal bowl or, or have a bowl and fill it up with water and top it with a layer of olive oil. And um, then in a darkened room by candlelight, they would have certain sorts of chants and so on that would induce these experiences of seeing apparitions of the deceased. So the reason I did this work uh, really, again, goes back to my interest, interest in ancient Greek philosophy because I, I thought if I could show that this was a plausible mechanism for uh, these stories that are gripping, really, that we get from the ancient world um, and, and also that had this enormous formative role in ancient Greek philosophy, then that would be a genuine contribution. So in 1990... Um, after doing some preliminary work for several years, I um, actually set this up, uh, which is just a little darkened chamber with a mirror in the front, and found that by um, just asking my subjects, who were initially my medical colleagues and my graduate students of, of uh, psychology, I was a psychology professor at that time, and um, that basically I just asked them to choose some one person who had died that they wanted to see again. And then they would come out to my place for essentially an all-day um, encounter. And uh, I would treat them as I would anybody who was coming with a grief problem, basically, which is, you know, the, the virtue of a uh, grief counselor is basically just to shut up and to ask good questions so that people will really bring up their feelings and so on. And so um, I found that if I would talk with people for about an hour or two um, in, in that way, getting them to reflect very deeply on the person they had lost, then in about 50% of the cases, on uh, the people who went into that chamber on the very first attempt would see a lifelike, uh, full-color, moving apparition of of the deceased. And um, you ask about specifically whether people under this circumstance talk. Well, what we found is that roughly a third, or about 30% of the people that you take through this will talk about uh, hearing what seems to be an audible voice, but almost all of the rest of them say that uh, um, although they did not hear an auditory uh, sensation that nonetheless they uh, they communicated with the apparition in a heart to heart or mind to mind way and um, so and incidentally this work has now been reproduced by many other people most notably I think by um, Do Dr. Arthur Hastings who is at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in Palo Alto California about well, I guess 16 or 17 years ago, they came out to my place and uh, they I taught them how to do it. And then they took it back to their institute, which is a psychotherapy training institute. And they've been experimenting with it for years and have published papers on it and so on. And uh, they use it as as a way of teaching their um 
their psychotherapy students uh, essentially a method of grief counseling, which it, which it was apparently used for in the ancient world as well. Well, can um, you can you have a relationship with just one being through this? I mean, can you have a repeated conversation with somebody that type of thing? You know, I suspect so. But, um, you know, there's been a very interesting phenomenon with this, and that's that you don't tend to get repeaters. That is that um, people come here, and if they have an experience, that is enough for them. Well, what has been your experience when, when, you, when you used it? Well, now, first of all, I've used it primarily in my work as a, just a mode of accessing my creativity, but um, I also used it, it when I in the when I was doing this with my students back in the 90s. Um, I decided I wanted to try it too, so I um, I went through the preparation to talk with my mother's mother, with whom I had a very close relationship. But in the event, it was not my mother's mother who showed up, but my father's mother, and I did have I. Really, words sort of fail here because I saw her with equal vividness as I am seeing my the surroundings in my living room right now as I'm talking with you. I heard her voice. I felt her presence. And yet... Twenty years later, I st- I just still can honestly tell you I don't know how to interpret that. Now, that's because I I tend to be a skeptic, not in the modern day sense. Unfortunately, these people who falsely call themselves skeptics don't even know the meaning of the word, and um, I am what you call a pyrrhonist skeptic. And, and um, Pyrrho was the original skeptic. He was a Hellenistic philosopher, uh, one of the schools of philosophy that originated in the wake of Aristotle's development of logic. And um, so I am a Pyrrhonist, so I just I don't know what to make of that. Well, let me ask but, you, did, did anything precipitate it in terms of uh, hearing a buzzing or a whirring sound or feeling sort of a change in consciousness or a change in the atmosphere and anything like that? No. As a matter of fact, it was just there she was all of a sudden. Now, there was one interesting thing, and I don't know what to call this, but it, several times during this encounter, I just intuitively moved forward to give my grandmother a hug, okay? And even though throughout the rest of this experience she was very, very verbal, as she was in life, just sort of constantly chattering away, those times that I leaned forward to give her a hug, she backed off and she put her hands up, and instead of saying something, she just shook her head no. And as this was going on, I know this sounds so utterly ridiculous and crazy, but I'm just telling you what I observed. And that is that all around her, as you looked at her, there seemed to be, it was as though she were recessed in space. I I know that doesn't make any sense, but um, kind of like she was a little bit indented from the ordinary physical reality, and that what you saw around the edge of her was something that you could vaguely call light. I mean, I don't know what else to call it. It was light, but that it didn't have the, as funny as this is to say, the substance to it that light does. I mean, you know, one of the first big questions of science was, what is light made of, and which preoccupied Descartes and uh, Newton and so on. Um, and, and the point of that being, I think, is that you do, when you look at light, it does seem to, to be something. Whereas this kind of light, quote, light, unquote, that I saw sort of emanating from around my grandmother, 
didn't seem to be what you see coming from the bulbs or from the sun. But it's just that that's as close as I can get to it. Maybe equally valid would be to call it electrical or something like that. But even to call it energy, I think, is a little bit of a misnomer because my suspicion is that we are not dealing with the physical level of reality mm -hmm. in, in this kind of thing. That's not to say that I understand what that other level of reality is like, but I sure do want to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, this is mind-blowing. Um, when you saw her, was and do these apparitions stay within the framework of the mirror or not? No, they don't. And it's really interesting because... Um, that's got to be somewhat disconcerting, right? I mean, <laughs> well, you know, that's exactly right. I did not anticipate it. Although, in retrospect, it made perfect sense because, um, you know, this is not anything new. I mean, this is not a, an invention of Raymond Moody. This literally, the earliest evidence of this sort of thing literally goes back 10,000 years to the uh, excavation of a temple site in Turkey where they found these crystals that had been obviously shaped so that people could hold them in their uh, hands and gaze into them. And, um, but, but when I started this out, I assumed that it would only be about one out of ten subjects would, would uh, see something. And if they did, it would be confined to seeing an, a vision in the mirror of the person they had set out to see. And that does happen sometimes, but there are numerous remarkable instances, such as you described, where the apparition actually does seem to step out of the mirror. And, um, uh, you know, then you think of all the folklore, for example, and what immediately came to my mind was Aladdin and the magic lamp. If uh, that's most of us read that story in the Golden Book version, which tells us that Aladdin rubs the lamp and then the genie appears, and that makes it seem like a uh, magic ritual or something. But if you read the full-length Arabian Nights entertainment, what you see is that um, the narrator makes a, a big point to say that this lamp was made of brass, and Aladdin and his mother decide to sell it. And so she takes fine sand, which would be an abrasive, and she polishes it, and it's in the depths of that polished brass surface that they first saw the apparition that then emerged from the surface and came out into the room with them. Huh. And I just never put it together until wow. after the fact. But um, that does absolutely happen. That uh, in a, an appreciable percentage of these people actually say that they see the apparition step out of the mirror. Or others will tell us that um, they feel that um, their consciousness goes through the mirror and they meet their deceased loved ones on the other side of the mirror in a sort of uh, parallel three-dimensional world. And um, that, of course, harks back to um, uh, Lewis Carroll through the looking glass. Right. And, uh, and um, if you read that account with that in mind, it's interesting that it's very plain that uh, Carroll knew what he was talking about because... Um, uh, what the narrator says, as Alice goes up to the mirror, the narrator says, and the mirror dissolved in a sort of silvery mist. And that's exactly what people say. They say that the first thing they see is this mist and cloud which clears up, and then the, the three possibilities. They see either they see the mirror, the apparition apparently on the other side of the mirror, and, and they the subject is on the the other side, or sometimes the people say the apparition emerges from the mirror, or other people may say that they feel their consciousness goes through the mirror into this alternate realm. Huh. Now, and incidentally, I guess, guys, this yeah. is easy to do. I mean, I guarantee you, you could set this up in your own 
place and take now it wouldn't necessarily work on the first attempt it takes practice believe me the could, last thing jeff needs in his house is the psycho okay gotcha if you know anything no. about jeff you would know that this is the no. last thing he needs right now i'm sitting here thinking to myself i've got to find out how to build this thing because <laughs> i'll do it um it's fascinating jeff it's just it, uh, yeah it, it sounds really, like cause the stories you get are just so amazing well, well, here's the here's the question. Then, if we're talking about a feeling of consciousness going into the mirror, mm-hmm. um, number one, let's let's clarify this for people because I, I think I'm right in saying this is that you don't see yourself in the mirror. The mirror is angled in such a way that you see a, a, a black cloth that is behind you, which is illuminated by. A 15 watt bulb behind you, correct? That's correct. That's correct. It's like you put the the chair about three feet in front of the wall, and you put the mirror high up on the wall relative to the eye line, so okay. that when you gaze up, when you gaze up into the mirror, you you see nothing but you don't see you black empty mm-hmm. space. Okay. Now that said, when you have the experience of seeing someone, whether it be in the mirror or outside the mirror, mm-hmm. in your experience, and in those that you did this with, what their experience, did you find that they still had the sense of their surroundings or not? Uh, well, not so much in the um, psychomantion because the, uh, the psychomantion is a very sparse environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even within that, yes, you still do remain aware of the walls and the mirrors and so on. But but Jeff, in about one quarter of the cases of somebody who has an experience, there's some sort of follow up experience, and they get when they get back to their own home. Really? And, uh, yeah. And in those cases, yeah, people say that they see the apparition right in their own living space. Okay. Now. And here's the other part. Then this is, and this is going to be my fear caveat of doing this. <laughs> um, how many people did you uh, sit into this this uh, this mechanism? And how many of those people actually came out of it saying, "Raymond, that was horrifying"? Uh, because clearly, when you do something like this, as you say, this goes back through aeons of time. This yeah. is not a new thing. Uh, and you're pretty far off the map. Uh, and, and you know what the pirates say, uh, out here there be monsters. So yeah. <laughs> how many people did you actually get a negative response from out of that? Nobody, Jeff. However, let me say this, that uh, two things, actually. Number one, I suspect that if you if you prepared people by frightening them or, you know, you, you know, you, who knows what you would get, but it's not something I would, would do. Mm-hmm. But secondly, I think that, you know, it's very easy when, you, when we're thinking about things like this to sort of, without even really becoming aware of it, kind of straying into derealistic thinking, that is, into, into thoughts that aren't very realistic. And what I would say generally about this is that The earliest mirror factory that has been excavated thus far goes back 6,000 years. And so human beings have, you know, been making mirrors for a long, long time. They're in every house. I mean, several times a day the average person looks into a mirror to brush their teeth or shave or whatever, and we don't even think about it. Now, it seems to me that... If there were any possible danger in gazing into a mirror, it seems to me we would know it by now. That right. would be the that would be the thought I would have in, in terms of possible dangers to this. But at the yeah. same time, this is not something I would do with a psychotic person, for example. <laughs> right. I, I, but I think it, I'm not even sure a psychotic person could do it. I mean, it takes us quite a. a uh, amount of organizing yourself and uh, concentration and and um, effort to sort of go through this whole process, right. and it's highly unlikely to me that a psychotic person would would be able to get organized. Would have that kind of focus to do that? Yeah, 
Um, well, I have to say, um, on this program, I mean, you, you had asked at the beginning what, what were some of the topics that we've covered. Mm-hmm. And one of them has been altered states. Yeah. And, uh, and, and one of the biggest things that Jeremy and I have talked a lot about is the work of uh, Terrence McKenna and Dr. Dennis McKenna. Uh, in the way of the the DMT compounds and psilocybin and all these sorts of psychedelic uh, materials. And, uh, you know, when you speak of this thing and you talk about the preparation and uh, and the environment and all of this, this sounds conspicuously familiar to me as like a set and setting type of uh, preparation uh, to have this sort of oh, experience. Sure. I mean, you know, this, this even in the, the the ancient period, this was the case. For example... The best evidence of the, the evocation procedure at this oracle of the dead on the Acheron, which Herodotus mentions and which is generally speaking the most famous one, but the best uh, statement we have on that indicates that uh, people would literally spend a month in this underground environment uh, preparing for this experience. I mean, this is, you're absolutely right in that the, uh, it's not just a matter of gazing into a mirror and voila, you know, grandma appears. It's that you go through, it's, it's a, um, it's a, it's a process, uh, rather than just a, an experience of sitting in front of a mirror and somebody pops out. Right, right. Although you... I should say, just to be, you know, being obsessive compulsive, I've always got to state all the facts. And <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> one fact is that um, uh, a- apparitions of the deceased that are spontaneous sometimes occur in mirrors too. I, I've heard quite a number of cases over the years of people who say that uh, they just happen to look up into the mirror and grandma, they saw grandma or whatever. Sure. Mean, you can find plenty of cases like this even in the, uh, the sort of crank uh, psychical research literature on this sort of thing that was done a hundred plus years ago where they uh, gathered um, uh, reports by assumedly um, reliable people who had, you know, experienced extraordinary apparitions, and and in those collections, you see a number in which the um, the person saw the apparition appear initially in a the optical depth of a of a lake or a uh, a mirror or whatever. Uh, in in uh, numerous cu- cultures in which this was done, including the Cherokee, which I'm particularly interested in since I have a Cherokee great-grandfather, but um, the Cherokee did this in clear ponds, and um, oh. they would you know, stand beside the pond and gaze and see the, the uh, visions form up in the depths of the water. Oh. Now, uh, again, when when you're looking at this apparition, that is either how do they? I guess I should say how do they materialize? Number one, I mean, how does how does that visual work? Does it work the same for everyone? And two, is there do, do they seem to be in an environment at all? Do you see uh, any sort of scenery behind them, or is it just them alone, isolated upon the blackness of the mirror? Uh, sometimes it is that they just appear in the in the mirror, but other times it's replete with uh, uh, scenery and so on and surroundings. And that's especially the case where um, people say that their consciousness is propelled into the mirror mm-hmm. and they meet with um, with deceased relatives. But a very interesting detail, at least in the ones I've done, which have that feature is that they, they just find it very difficult to describe the surroundings. And, and the, the, what often comes to my mind in listening to them try is, um, for example, what's like when you're looking at one of those Escher prints and um, you can see the hooded figure going around and around and around the four-sided staircase and each figure, if you look at it, it goes up and then turns left or, you know, turns the corner and then goes up and then turns another corner and goes up, then another corner and turns and goes up. And then they end up at the where they began, right? And right. so similarly, it's, it's like people, the, the difficulty that they have in describing the structural features of it 
seems to me to be very uh, commensurate with what the difficulties you have, for example, in describing those the Klein bottle or all, all those different weird um, uh, uh, graphic figures that we get from um, Escher and his, and other artists who've done. So that. almost almost in the sense that geometry doesn't adhere to what we're used to seeing in daily life. Uh, well, that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, there's a very interesting um, French, um, very fine man, a, a general practitioner in France, who's for 20 years been investigating the near-death experience because he began to hear them from his own patients. And he was very impressed by the uh, geometric anomalies that the patients would describe. For example, uh, patients often will tell you that they see through walls or whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, he he got so interested in this that he, even though he didn't really have much interest per se in mathematics and geometry, he went back and did a thorough study of the geometry of higher dimensions and then did a fantastic book in France, in France a few years ago in which he applies all this and tries to show that um, that what, pa- what patients with near-death experiences, that what they tell us about uh, the, the impossible geometries that they witness um, is really quite consistent with a fifth, uh, a fifth dimension mm-hmm. geometry. Mm-hmm. Because it turns out, if there were a fifth dimension and you were conscious, then you could see through walls, essentially. Right. I mean, the wall would not uh, be an impediment as it is to me right now. I can't see past my wall, but right. apparently, at least some people, uh, you know, when they almost die and seem to be out of their bodies, what they report anyway is that the wall does not seem to be an impediment. Huh. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift gears a little bit and ask you about the shared near-death experiences. And you, uh, if, I'm, if I'm right, you actually uh, you know, experienced this yourself. Um, can, you, can you kind of walk me through a little bit of what, what did you see? What was your perception of the event itself? Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, uh, let me give credit where credit is due, and that is that... Um, when I first heard about these was in my first year of medical school. One of my own medical school professors, a very nice lady, approached me in the um, the bookstore at the medical school one night and said she had an experience she wanted to tell me about. And she took me across campus to her office and she told me that some years before she had uh, had the hor- horrific experience that it, as it could have been of... Uh, being there when her mother had a cardiac arrest and she was forced to resuscitate her own mother. And uh, she said, but her mother unfortunately died uh, during the attempt. But she said as her mother died that she herself, this physician, felt herself get out of her body and she saw her mother, to use her exact words, in spirit form, unquote, there with her and she saw her mother recede into this light and relatives and friends that uh, had died of her mother's that had died before seemed to be coming from this light to to um, to meet her and through the 70s uh, I heard quite a number of the shared death experiences but then it was primarily from doctors and nurses that is that when i would be at a lecture or something a doctor would come up afterward and say that what as patient x died that um the doctor would seem to reported seeing what seemed to be the replica or a spirit or whatever word you would want to use uh, uh of the patient would get up and move away or sometimes see lights or sometimes see apparitions of the deceased, uh, the apparitions that seem to be um, coming to greet the, the uh, deceased or whatever. And so I heard quite a number of these and then beginning in the mid to late 80s, I began to hear more and more of these coming, not from doctors and nurses, but from 
people who were there when a relative died. And now, this is entirely my conjecture, but I think it's a plausible one. And, and that is that when I entered medical school in the early 70s, the standard hospital practice was that when the patient was dying, the doctors and nurses would come in in this sort of paternalistic attitude. And the idea would be that, that you know, that this was too overwhelming for the patient's families. So the doctors and nurses would sort of escort the family out, and the doctor or nurse would be there for the terminal events. Well, then, now, you see, in 2011, that is almost entirely reversed. Now it's the standard hospital practice that the doctors and nurses encourage the family to be there until the end. And so they're with concurrently with this radical shift of the hospital practice, I saw the change in these um, these uh, empathic or shared death experiences to where by the early 90s, I wanted to do a systematic investigation of this. And in May of 94, I went out west with a group of other doctors and psychologists and so on, and we were thinking of a um, trying to figure out uh, ways to investigate this systematically, and I was all hepped up about this. Well, we finished up our meeting on Mother's Day, May of 1994, and I called my mother from the um, from the shopping mall, the payphone, to wish her a happy Mother's Day. And when I did, uh, yeah. I, Naturally, I asked her, how are you doing? And she, I remember, she was very cheerful and chipper, and she said, oh, I'm doing great, you know, just like that. And, uh, and she said, but the day before, she had developed a rash, and my, doc, my uh, brothers and sisters had gotten rather concerned, and they took her to the doctor who examined her and didn't think this was anything serious, but to make a long story short, gave her an appointment to come back that following Monday, the day after I talked to her, turned out that she had uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and she died two weeks to the day after the diagnosis. Jeez. And my wife and I were there for the whole time, the last two weeks. And as my mother died, again, words fail here, but the best way I can describe to you is, again, there was that light that is indescribable light, this feeling of peace, and again, this feeling of the shift in geometry of the room. Um, it, was, it was as though that instead of in a cubicle hospital room, you were in a kind of funnel or two funnels put end to end, basically, was how it felt. And um, my sister who was there uh, experienced the presence of my father who had died about 18 months before. Uh, my my uh, wife it had similarly a very uh, profound experience like mine, and so um, that was my story. But but rather than inspiring my interest in this, actually, guys, um, this kind of put a crimp on my interest in it. It it's like I had been all set up to investigate this more systematically, and then when I had my own experience, it was kind of as though that that took all the air out of my curiosity. You know what I mean? Yeah, you and, knew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, but then as the years passed, and I began to hear more and more of these, and I began to realize fully the significance of them in terms of, um, you know, how what they mean about the standard debate, namely that the standard sort of objection isn't valid anymore, plus on top of that having uh, worked out this new system of logic in which there is a way to think about this logically, then it all sort of clicked to me, and out of that came Glimpses of Eternity, this new book with guideposts in which I uh, talk about essentially all these astonishing uh, shared death experiences I've heard hundreds and hundreds of them now yeah I, I mean I think what's amazing to me is you know anyone who who would watch anything uh, documentary wise on uh, near death experience or uh, there's this new one now that's on a bio I believe it's called uh, yeah, uh, I, I survived death and back great 
program, and I never fail to watch. I mean, I can't watch more than a couple episodes at a time. But uh, that I've it, had that same reaction to that show. It's just it's <laughs> too overwhelming. Yeah, it, it is. You know, yeah, it, it, it really is. is. Uh, but I, I hear this uh, constantly that uh, you get these people talking about there were people there who I knew, like mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, but then were there were people behind them that I didn't recognize. And, yeah, and so yeah. you immediately make this connection. Well, this is relatives that they didn't know or had already passed before they were born or that sort of thing. And what amazes me about this is that my mom uh, had a girlfriend that you know she met uh, when I was in kindergarten. Uh, I went to school with her daughter, and her mom recently passed away. Mm-hmm. And as her mom... Uh, is laying in bed. It's clear that she's gonna she's going to die. Uh, everybody knew it. She knew it. Uh, but she wasn't um, she wasn't comatose. She wasn't uh, asleep. She wasn't sedated. Uh, she was just shutting down, uh, most yeah. likely from Parkinson's. And uh, and and um, and she made several comments to the nurse. Uh, it must be getting close. And they said, what, what, do you, what do you mean, Reba? And she said, um, there's a man here in this chair for me. And the chair was empty to the nurse. And she says, do you know who the man is? And she says, well, of course I do. It's my husband. And he died, I remember, when I was a little boy. Uh, so this kind of thing not only happens at, at, at the, you know, the, the dying experience or the near death, but this happens sometimes long before uh, oh, yes, yes, I mean, absolutely. And, and she did know, pass that night. Then, uh, yeah. you know, I find it to be just many hospice workers <laughs> will be able to give you many cases of that same thing. And I saw it with a lot of my terminally ill patients that, in the last few days, it was or you know weeks, it was they sort of woke up to this other level of stuff that was going on around them. Yes. And, you know, they were completely coherent. It wasn't like talking with a person who's deliriously rambling because they could talk to me with complete coherence. Absolutely. And and realize, have the full insight that I didn't see the deceased person. And that's not characteristic of somebody who's confused, is confused mentation. I mean, these people seemed if anything, sharper than the <laughs> yes. average person. Yeah. Well, and that's that's kind of what I was going to ask you about is uh, uh, my, my own grandfather. Um, my grandmother died uh, very young. Uh, she had a, a host of health problems. Uh, and, and her husband, my grandpa, uh, I mean, both of them, I miss them horrifyingly bad. I mean, to this day. Oh, oh me too. And man, me too. Uh, it's, I miss my grandmother so much. Oh, I mean, it, it's it's terrible. I mean, and, and I'll tell you, this past holiday, as I'm now 43, going on 44, uh, it just seems like it gets worse with age. I mean, it's oh, like this year, I really you felt so this. Much, you wish so much you could go back and... Ask exactly. Questions and have conversations. Absolutely. Yeah. But one thing about about Pop was that he had uh, Parkinson's disease, and I watched this hugely strong uh, construction worker uh, man who uh, he was just one of these guys that um, uh, he was like the pillar of his community. Uh, he he took food to to families that didn't have any food. He out of his own pocket. He was this kind of man. Uh, and I watched him kind of degrade to the point where uh, he didn't know my mother, uh, he didn't know me. And so when he got really bad, uh, my mom said we should take him to the hospital, and his doctor's answer was uh, to get better for what? And that it was at that point we knew, oh, he's dying. And so we kept him comfortable at home, and and uh, what I wanted to ask you is, I don't, and I hear this from so many people, and I just can't understand it, that my grandfather's mind was simply not there. Yeah. And yet, there was this point where me, my mom, his sisters, his three sisters were all around him. He opens his eyes. Yes. And he starts talking to us like, hey, it's Pop. He's back. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. What yes. is going on? I mean, how? And he looked at me and he says, uh, you know, Jeffrey, you got to, you know, 
you got to be good and you got to do this and that. And we had this conversation and I'm like, pop, you're okay. I mean, you're okay. Are you good? Yeah, you're okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, and he's like, no, you're, I'm going to be with your grandma and, and this, yeah. that, and the other. And it was this completely coherent. What is that about? Do you think? I that- wish I knew, <laughs> Jeff, but I tell you, you have put your finger on a really big mystery here. And if you look up the word say, F E Y in a comprehensive dictionary like the O E D or something. Mm-hmm. What you're gonna now? There's a lot of de- definitions of it, but the sort of focal definition is that the state of say is a state of heightened awareness that portends um, uh, imminent death. And mm-hmm. I just hear this all the time. I saw it in my father. I saw it in my mother. That people people will seem obtunded. It's like you're just sort of sitting around the bedside thinking, well, you know, they're just sort of waiting for the heart to stop, not mm-hmm. thinking that yes, furthest from your mind that there could be any um, conversation. For the conversation, <laughs> and suddenly the person comes back to life. I mean, if you've seen this, you know what I mean. It, Absolutely. It, they seem more alive than alive, right? It's like yeah. all of their neurosis has has dropped off. Yeah, and, yeah. And what – this is to me a real mystery. And and um, what I think happened is if you look at that word say in the dictionary, you will see that our great-grandparents understood this perfectly because people died at home. But then when we lost track of this was back in the 30s and 40s when people started dying in hospitals. Uh But now that there's been a further change in the hospital practice and the family is invited in, it's more and more people are seeing this. I guarantee Uh you that if you went a room of 200 people and you described that experience, and especially people in the midlife range, uh, you just—I mean—it is a very common experience and utterly inexplicable, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've—I've I've talked about that with a lot of people, and, and they've related stories. I mean, just about every person I tell it to says, "Oh yeah, I told my yeah. dad or my mom or, yeah. or whatever." Now, here is the other thing that is a little strange about Pop when he passed. Uh, my mom uh, and I were asleep on the couch when he passed. Now, I had. Uh, the only thing that I can figure was uh, a a dream which involved him leaving, uh, which I've never really talked about, so I I won't start now. (laughs) But uh, uh, there was, as she was uh, awakened to go in uh, to the room because my aunts woke her up and said, it it looks like he is going, Uh, she said when she walked into the room, that he was saying Maya over and over and oh over goodness. again until it became a whisper. My goodness. Any clue? Have you heard that before? Do you know what well, that is? It, you know, I do think I know that. Now, this there is a much larger context for this, mm-hmm. but there's a, a related phenomenon um, that I named the swan song phenomenon in honor of Plato's version of it, because Plato is the first person I knew who who recorded it. And and what I can tell you from my experience is um, that a lot of people, absolutely, although in percentage terms it's not very high, but in absolute terms it's high, will... As they are dying, even if, according to their families, they never had any prior interest in poetry or song, will start singing songs or or reciting poetry or sometimes making up poetry on the spot. Hmm. And it sounds to me that it, what he was doing essentially was chanting. Right. And... and um, I do know, for example, in certain of the Gnostic uh, religions, there was a spiritual practice they did as a discipline while they were alive that they had to 
um, compose poetry, but it was generally speaking nonsense poetry. Just like with doo-wop music, you don't want meaning, right? The point of sha na 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 sha na 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 right. what it does to your mind, right? Uh, um, quite apart from any meaning, right? And so um, these. Um, Gnostics would would you know compose these sort of sequences of nonsense sounds and all, and the idea would be that they would hopefully have the presence of mind as they were dying to recite this as they were passing away, and the idea was that it supposedly would sort of tune them to the new reality that they were going to enter into. Wow. And and all of these things, you see, it's nothing esoteric. I think it is just built into us. And yeah. uh, it doesn't have, you know, you're, uh, he didn't have to um, be a practitioner of any religion or even know about these things. It, it just comes out naturally in people that in the um, final days or hours of life, they turn to these... Uh, non-literal verbal modes of expression and uh, chants or poems or songs. Hmm. And, and uh, Socrates, the Plato in his uh, dialogue, the Phaedo, describes this with Socrates, um, who in the last few days of his life was uh, writing songs. And his friends think this is very bizarre because, you know, he had always talked about what a horrible thing song and music is and so on but they you know they the between the lines implication is that maybe he's slipping right under the the influence of this imminent death but he immediately says oh no no he says i'm doing this in obedience to dreams and visions that tell me to get busy uh on music and uh then he goes on to compare it to the swan song because the Greeks had a sort of folk belief that um, swans make the most beautiful songs of all just as they are dying. And mm -hmm. and Socrates sort of speculates that what this is about is that it's attuning them to the uh, new reality that they're about to enter into. Huh. Well, and and here's where I go back the other way, where I say you know, I, I we've heard the light. We've heard about the tunnel. We've heard about um, we've heard about beings, uh, whether they be uh, family members who have passed or an assemblance of what's described as angels. Um, and we've heard, you know, uh, some horrifying uh, near death experiences where it's some assemblance of what anyone would gauge and say it's hell, or at least a taste of it. Um, all of those aside, what have you discovered over the years as far as truly bizarre and nonconformist uh, near-death experiences that people have described to you that you go, what in the hell do I do with this? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I do have a collection of those, about mm -hmm. 19 of them approximately, of uh, things that are, you know, are just totally unheard of that... that don't fit in uh, at all. And so the, over the years, I've been collecting them, uh, hoping I can, um, you know, find some others like them. And um, in other words, you can't really say much of anything in, until you have a pattern, right? But if you right. have a couple of cases of something, then there's a pattern. And so I do have a number of cases that are just totally outliers, as it were, that... Um, that don't really fit into any of the other things. Uh, well, I take that back. Um, some of them are, have other features like getting out of the body and seeing the light or whatever, but then there's some other turn that doesn't take place in any other narratives. And I do have a few cases of those, like I said, 19 or so, but... Um, you know, the question is, what do you do with them? I mean, and, like, hopefully, eventually I'll get around to um, to publishing that, and I'm just sort of figuring if I can wait long enough, then maybe some other examples of the same thing will pop up. Whereas if I um, just go on and publish them without that backup, then, you know, it could always be said, well, then this created the 
of the scenario, right? Right. So, you know, it's Were a, any of the Muppets? <laughs> no, no Muppets. Because yeah, so somebody on our there is a thread on one of our message boards about a near death experience involving Muppets that somebody had seen Muppets. Wow. Well, who knows? Who knows? Um, it, one one thing you do get in difficulty in, into here is distinguishing a a delirium of a person from a near-death experience. And the way, generally speaking, that I do that is that delirious visions tend to be very, very surrealistically distorted, uh, you know, with very bizarre images and so on. Whereas these near-death experiences that are in the, follow the sort of classic pattern plainly seem to be from within clear consciousness. In other words, even as the person describes it, they describe it in a sequence and coherently and so on, Whether, whereas a person who just has a, a delirium in the, clo- in the course of a close call with death, the imagery is very bizarre and it's, it's kind of dreamlike. Where would you Where, place the, uh, the hell imagery? Well, you know, I have a little trouble with this one because, I, again, it's you get into the pattern problem. It's, um, I do have cases of negative ones, but the trouble is that the negative ones are far more spread out. In, in other words, that um, there seem to be about three major categories of negative ones. Um, one being that people have this sort of standard imagery or, or statements, I got it in my body and so on, but rather than describing it as something um, uh, positive in its feeling import. It's described as dysphoric. Then there's another kind of case where that someone starts out in a sort of gosh-awful scenario, but then the experience con- converts somewhere in the middle into this more pleasant thing. And then the ones that are, to in my sample anyway, the very smallest percentage are those in which there is explicit hellish imagery, you know, like with um, monsters or um, flames or whatever. And again, these just seem to me a lot more variegated. And so I don't know what to think about them. I mean, I just, generally speaking, they do seem to me to be to fall more down on the surrealistic side. Well, could you and, give us an example of one of the uh, outliers, just so we know what an outlier looks like? Yeah, well, I can go on and talk about this one a little bit, I think, because I just uh, this was one I heard, um, gosh, I don't know how many years ago, from um, a, a case in which a... Um, fairly young woman, um, and I, I had plenty of backup from this in terms of the family and so on, had had a, a cardiac arrest, and when she came back, uh, she claimed to be this other person, an elderly woman, and the young, uh, her story was that the young, uh, the young woman uh, had just didn't want to come back, but this this older woman who happened to be dying nearby at the same time that in effect they traded they traded bodies and uh, I talked to the family some family members that were just astonished by this but couldn't deny that this was a totally different person who had come back with this claim which she did not make in a raving way but just as a sort of matter of fact and um, that would have, you know, that was the only case I heard of this until just a couple of months ago. I was in the Czech Republic, and lo and behold, I heard an almost identical account from a young man there. It happened in, to some person of his acquaintance um, who had had a very similar thing, except in this case it was a young man who had traded bodies with an elderly man who was dry, uh living nearby and uh now you see i mean i have two cases of this so there is a a sort of pattern wow and and it seems in in the in this, these two cases the 
basic idea was that a, a younger person had um, died and in the passageway in this cardiac arrest state had, had traded positions with an elderly person who was dying nearby. The young person didn't come back, but the elderly person did, and the young body. And does the and elderly that, person and, say in both things? Cases, in both cases, the family mm-hmm. um, went along with this, and, and you couldn't deny that they saw this difference in the person. Does the family of the elderly person get involved at The all? family of the young person. Not to my knowledge, in either case was it that mentioned, but... Um, Hmm. Let me ask you this. I have a friend who just last night told me of a near-death experience she had. She calls it a, uh, I think, a non-traumatic near-death experience where she didn't die. She was driving with her kids, Uh and all of a sudden, boom, she finds herself in a light or a world of light or whatever, and she has a little conversation with uh, a voice, (laughs) and Mm -hmm. she feels completely egoless, and the voice says... It's not your time. You've got to go back. And she says, no, I don't want to stay. They have that bit yeah. of bargaining. And uh, he says something like, you know, don't worry. Um, you know, it, whatever happens in, in life, everything is as it should be or something along those lines. And sends her back. Yeah. And it's so powerful that when she gets back home, she pulls over and she cries and, and all that. And she was wondering if you had heard of cases oh, of yes, people who yes, have yes. not died who went to heaven or whatever this is. Uh, absolutely. This is, um, a matter of fact, um, these same kinds of things that we we recognize as a near-death experience occur in other circumstances than in, um, than, than in close calls with death. And uh, sometimes just spontaneously without any apparent precipitating or uh, connecting factors, but other times... Uh, with with very specific kind of stimuli. For example, um, I have a friend in Paris named Eric Pagani, who's a very sweet person, and he's very well known in uh, uh, was very well known in classical mu- music uh, circles, and he was a concert pianist in addition to being a psychologist. And um, Back in 1988, Eric told me about how he was performing a concert, a piano concert, and uh, he said suddenly he just found himself out of his body and in this beautiful light. And uh, this experience went on a very equivalent almost to a near-death experience. Then when he found himself back in the body, the peace was over. And so I said, well, did the people seem to like it. And Eric is very modest. And he said, well, yes, they seem to. But fortunately, his girlfriend was there, and she had been to that concert, and she said, well, as a matter of fact, the audience was literally jumping up and down and yelling and screaming, but because the music was so profound. And so Eric said said to himself, well, you know, if that happens has happened to me, then it's happened to other people. And so he knew a lot of very well-known opera singers and so on. So he just asked them around among his own friends. And he quickly found lots of cases where uh, people who were singing, for example, beautiful music would, would find themselves in this light and out of their bodies. And he wrote a book uh, on on it, which was published in France some years ago called Spirituality and Music. And and another one, which is of particular interest to me, being a an astronomy buff, is um, a friend of mine who's an astronomer at Harvard gave uh, gave me this paper some years ago on um, cases in which astronomers gazing at their telescopes, gazing through their telescopes, would suddenly find themselves out of their bodies, looking at themselves gazed through the telescope. So, uh, you know, there's you don't have to be near death to have elements of these near death experiences. Mm-hmm. Well, oh. you have generously given us way more of your time than uh, we expected. Oh no, it's the other way around, guys. Thank you <laughs> so much. Thank you. Listening. Thank you. I mean, we Listen. we I have a thousand more questions for you. So Me too. Me please, too. Yeah. Please come back on. <laughs> oh, I'd love to. Really, really. Excellent. And, um, um, yeah, I would love to talk with you guys again. I really would. So let's do it, please. Great. Thank you very much. Raymond Moody, your new book is Glimpses of Eternity. 
sharing a loved one's passage from this life to the next. I am almost done with it. It's a great read. It's informative. Uh, so thank you once again for, for coming on. <laughs> thank you, guys. Uh, this is Colin Andrews, and you're listening to Paratopia. If you record audio for any purpose, chances are you want it to be heard. You want to attract the largest audience possible who can hear your message. That's where we come in. We're CyberEars.com, a revolutionary Internet service that will host your audio files and help you promote and track its popularity. Considering hosting a podcast to the world, we have all the automated tools to make the process as simple and easy as it can be. No technical mumbo-jumbo to work out. CyberEars.com does all the work for you. You record it, we take care of the rest. So don't delay. Go to CyberEars.com today and register for a free trial account. Upload your audio files and get heard. With CyberEars.com, it's your audio on your terms. So the Jeff. So the Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if anyone wants to know what that opening skit was uh, lampooning, that would be um, the Nick Pope. If you go to YouTube and you put in Nick Pope and uh, Rendlesham and trailer, it will come right up. This trailer for it doesn't unless you read the YouTube uh, 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 fine print, you won't know if it's for a movie or a TV show or what, because it doesn't say in anything in the trailer. It just says, whoever posted it says, this is a trailer for a TV show pilot. <laughs> uh, let's, hope the, let's hope to God it's a joke. <laughs> Please let it's it It's not a joke. That's the sad thing. No. This is really the, this is like him going, credibility, the bank, credibility, the bank. <laughs> I know. I'll go to the bank. Ah. Uh. <laughs> please let it be a joke. Please let it be some no, sick I mean, joke I think, of editing and please. Well, someone told me that Nick Pope said, uh, you can't judge by the trailer, you know. Oh, no, no, that, no. Uh, you know, oh. that it's not all that. But it's like, well, but you do have a hypnotist of 20 years and a psychic looking into this, correct? I mean, these are the people that you've assembled to do it the Nick Pope way, right? So it's like I... Uh, I'm willing to bank that the trailer is in fact showing us the highlights of what we're going to see or else. Why would they put it together? <laughs> they... Let's see what the speaking spell has to say. Uh, unbelievable. <laughs> so that's that. Anyway, uh, moving right along, Raymond Moody, eh? Yeah, wow. How about that? Good stuff. Uh, what did we learn here? Uh, that dying is probably going to be a lot more like a DMT experiments experience than... Uh... <laughs> Than anything else. Uh, no. I, I I mean, you can't help but hear that stuff and go, my God, does that sound like stuff we've heard before, you know, namely from the psychedelic realm of things. And, um, I mean, I find the, the, the shared stuff to be, blah, like, wow. Uh, I mean, I, I would... I would love to, to speak to those people firsthand. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if there were four people in the room or five people, like what did each one perceive as this was happening? I, I, I think it's amazing. I think that is truly, truly amazing. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, you know what kind of amazed me at the, the very onset of the talk was that he wasn't entirely sure about life after death. <laughs> yes. Really? Well, I read I, just in perusing like Amazon reviews of books and stuff, there was one book where he came out and I think even said he's not sure. And it really confused his fan base because they always thought he was dead sure. Yeah. No pun intended. But yeah, but he had said, I'm I, I'm not convinced. Uh, yeah, I, I find that amazing. I mean, well, I think it, it speaks a lot to his um, his critical thought skills. Um you know, and and the the willingness not to be swayed by just you know x amount of stories told well, by x amount of stories, but also his own experience, own personal experience. Yeah. Uh, Although but, he, he might have written that before his own personal experience, that would be an interesting thing to find out. I mean, do you sit, write something like that and then in response have an experience? 
Oh, well, certainly wouldn't be out of the realm for this stuff, would it? Um, and I did find the, uh, and what's the name of the device again? The, I, I thought it was called the Psychomantium. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's fascinating. And I, I got to build one. <laughs> I got to do it. I got to do it. I, I just, I, I mean, I hear him talk about that, and and again, the whole thing sounds like set and setting, uh, you know, in terms of the the psychedelic preparations of of what you're doing. You prepare all day long. Uh, you you have an item where you're focusing the intent upon this person that you wish to see. Although apparently, in his case, that didn't pan out exactly the way he actually saw someone else. That he, that he wasn't focusing on, but even still, I mean, it's just a, it's an amazing thing, uh, and the experience of it coming out of the mirror, or you going through it, or it just being in the mirror, I mean, all of these different things, that would be uh, a, a truly fascinating read to see every case study uh, of every person who experienced something using that method. Well, I find it hard to believe that he's not constantly using that thing and hasn't oh my God. Like, written yeah. a, a book in secret from entity or entities that he's encountered there. I mean, well, it just well, here, like you would. I mean, I mean, here's the thing for me that I always ask, and, and I ask this about every kind of paranormal thing that has seemingly been around forever. Um, you know, this went back to what, the ancient Greeks, correct? Because um, this was the other night. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure I'm remembering everything correctly, but uh, where did they get it? I mean, where does this come from? How does this originate? I mean, well, well, I mean, if you ask the Greeks, stuff like this originates from the gods or the goddess, from the goddess, I should say. Yeah, I mean, not that that's really an answer for me, you know. But I mean, I, you know, we we talked in private afterward, and I asked him, "What do you think of Peter Kingsley's work?" Because he'd mentioned Parmenides, and that's you know, Peter Kingsley's book Reality is all about Parmenides and and Mm -hmm. poem that he was given, Um, right. And his answer was he really likes Peter Kingsley's work and that he's one of the few scholars uh, who just tells you um, straight out, (laughs) you know, what was said Hmm. as opposed – and I think what he means by that is as opposed to translating it for you into something that is not – because really, what they said is what they meant, you know. I spoke not a reinterpretation, goddess. right? Well, yeah, because uh, I mean, essentially, what Peter Kingsley is saying is that um, that the you know grandfather of reason, who's Parmenides, uh, actually, it, it's a misinterpretation of what he was saying. He was actually talking about transrational or mm-hmm. trans logic, but rational people could only hear the rational part and they didn't know what to do with the rest of it, so they sort of threw it away. So Peter Kingsley just comes along and says, no, this is actually what he said. This is what he meant. Um, It's all right here. Duh. It's just scholars don't know what to make of it. Okay, here's a question for you. Explain trans logic and trans rational. Well, it's the whole reason that you can't um, have the uh, Godhead experience um, through thought. It's that which transcends rationality and thought. So it's basically... Uh, we spend our lives trying to solve things rationally and logically, but when you break beyond that, when you just shut up, when you calm thought and all that stuff, this other higher order of order, (laughs) higher order of impeccability, I don't know what to call it, uh, of instruction takes over on the one hand in the form of that energy that like, you know, moves you around, makes you do, uh, healthy exercises and all that, Mm -hmm. but it also, um, can open you up to communing with what appear to be gods and goddesses and things like that. And that's um, transrational thought is that's what that's considered. Yeah, that would be that would be a transrational experience. Something okay. that that is not of your own thought but is um happening when you stop thinking basically. Mm. Okay. Um and I think it's the same you know, or similar to the any of the shamanic journeys, any of the DMT stuff, you know? It that's okay. doing the same thing. It's you recess into the background and the realer than real experience comes to the foreground. Hmm. Curious. Well, I mean, it's um, it, it's a completely fast. I mean, we're trying to actually, or I'm trying to get some people on who have actually experienced firsthand 
a, a near death experience and uh and I think at some point we're probably going to try and put together a round table with Dr. Moody and maybe I don't know three or four people who've actually had this experience firsthand. I think that's an important thing to do uh is to talk directly, but I I don't know what to make of the uh you know uh the mirror of the dead stuff. I don't I mean that blows my mind and so therefore i've got to at least give it a shot and see what it does um i'm just wondering you know how you know I, i'm going to write him and ask me like what are we talking about for angles of the mirror what are we talking about as far as you know give me the give me the uh the blueprint plans uh if there is such a thing i have uh, the book i know. think it's called reunions okay um i can Give that to you or mail it to yeah. you or whatever if you want. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, because I, I do want to definitely try that. And then that way, when you come to visit, I'll put you in it. Oh, great. Um. <laughs> I don't know why you want to – again, why are you building this thing? It's like you know the guy in the you know shroud is just going to come and be like, okay, tilt the mirror this way. You know, it's like, <laughs> I, I'll just show you like how silly it is that you're building this in the first place. Well, I <laughs> They're mean, already coming to you. You don't need a mirror. Well, here's the thing. I mean I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll – be, uh, I'll be Mr. Open here. I mean, uh, you know, I mentioned my my uh, my nan and pop, uh, uh, you know, and the fact that, of how badly that I do miss them even still. And, you know, my granddad died, I think, when I was in um, 10th or 11th. I'm sorry. That was my grandmother died in 10th and 11th grade. Um, my granddad uh, died probably – Somewhere in my first year of college, I'm guessing, somewhere in there. Uh, I mean, it's been, you know, decades ago. And um, it, it is bizarre to me that, that uh, well, there's two bizarre things about the whole situation. I mean, my, my Nana had uh, a host of problems her whole life with her health. She had lupus. She had horrible, horrible arthritic problems. Her hands just look like, uh, I mean, horrifyingly bad, just mangled up. She she could definitely get around, you know, with her hands. She could definitely do all the things that you would want to do. But I remember how swelled her knuckles used to get and how bad they hurt her to the point where her knuckle skin would split. It was so swollen. Uh, whereas my granddad and I, we had this thing of fishing and uh, and we owned boats throughout my whole life. Um my dad and and he you know bought boats together and we go out fishing and all that sort of thing and pop was a relatively healthy guy and was a construction worker he uh he ran the big cranes that you see on top of the skyscrapers with all of that trellis underneath of them and that's what he did along with the ground base units and um and he retired and i would say it wasn't wasn't two years before he had developed uh, Parkinson's, and I will never forget uh, watching this incredibly strong guy, just the kindest person you would ever want to meet, uh, and and somebody who selflessly took care of other people, and he didn't even have to know you. I mean, if he knew your family was going about without food, he'd go get you food. It was just that kind of guy. I mean, I've got tons of stories from my mom about that sort of thing. And I watched him disintegrate. And so I think about them both, but I think about him more. Uh, I think because his death was – I was much older uh, when he passed away. And and while I think that Nana's death was – she had heart failure uh, four or five times. And her doctors said, you know, most people don't survive more than one or two. Uh, and she went in the hospital for a totally unrelated cause and died uh, in the hospital. I mean, I will never forget my mom waking me up. I don't know, you know, three o'clock in the morning or something. And me hearing this incredibly weird noise coming from the kitchen. And it was my grandfather hysterically crying because the police had come to his door and told him his wife was dead. I, I think so much more about Pop, and I would like to see him. I came home from uh, – and I, I mentioned on the show, you know, Christmas this year. Uh, I don't know. I, I just thought about them an awful lot, and, and Dr. Moody's right. I mean you wish that they could see your son. You wish they could see your house and, and what, you've, what, you've, uh, what you've made of yourself, and, and that's true, but I just miss them. I just really horribly miss them. 
And, uh, you know, I remember standing in the living room uh, this Christmas and um, uh, and Lisa was down at her mom and dad's house and, and uh, Cody was off at the girlfriend's house. And I'm home alone and I just I, I sat in the middle of the uh, couch and just cried about it, uh, which I, I mean, I was just like, what what the hell is wrong with me? Why am I so upset over this this this? You know, maybe it's just the Christmas blues, that kind of thing. Uh, but I just sat there and I said, you know, I want to see him. You know, I don't, I won't be afraid. I just want to see him. Uh, and so if something like this, whatever it is, I mean, whatever it really is, if it's really them or whether it's just visionary, uh, I think it would be, it would be nice to see them. And, uh, and so that would be the reason that I would want to build it, you know, just to purely see them if it, you know, if it works, it, I don't, I don't think I would approach it in the same way that I would approach like sky watching, which has a fearful element to it. I mean, this is my man and pop. I mean, you know, um, so that's, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, it, I think that I've got enough intent or desire to 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 see them to to you know to, to try to do that um and and apparently you know from what uh, dr moody was saying that that is that's a lot of the part of it is bringing that that uh, personal item with you talking about them i mean are we seeing the, the pattern here folks of this focus of intent again it's the focus of intent coupled with Whatever this ancient practice is, whatever the mechanism is for that, um, so that's why I would like to try it. I mean, it's it's purely a personal reason, I guess. Yeah, on the power of intent, or maybe even the malleability of this is more to it. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were asking about the hell experiences, and he said, um, often they if they start out like that, they end up good. I wonder what he thinks about the ones that, you know, where the books were written about, I went to hell and all that. I mean, do you think that those are just sort of, you know, I don't know, Meyer material for them? <laughs> or or did, do those things happen? Uh, is is uh, Raymond Moody uh, an optimist <laughs> Well, <laughs> where, where, when it comes to that? I mean, certainly there's been, there's there's definitely been, I mean, over the years I've heard a lot of accounts of people who witnessed horrible visions when they were dying uh, or were dead. And I think there was one not awfully long ago, not on one of the, not on one of the, you know, the, 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 the common repeated shows, uh, but like one of those specials, I think it might've been the day I died. I think it was on that uh, where a man, you know, basically um, was in the hospital, died, and said he got up out of bed and there was a man waiting for him in the hallway and he walked past all of the doctors that were working on him and this man says, you need to come with me. And he took his hand and, uh, and in turn was led into blackness uh, where uh, this being and others, uh, from what he said, literally tore him apart. And he said the pain was unbelievable. And then they, they vacated. They left him. Uh, in pieces in the dark uh, on whatever ground there was, to which point he, you know, this is apparently a man who never believed in God or spirituality of any kind, and and uh, and that's when he began praying. And when he did, he was back in his body again. I, I mean, I, I don't know what to make of that, whether that's, um, first of all, the question begs, you know, how dead are you? Because <laughs> there are varying, I think there are varying depths. Somebody who's dead for fifty minutes, as I saw one day on on television, a, a young man in high school, fifty minutes, as opposed to nine minutes or whatever. Brain death occurs in around five. So, I think there does have to be some kind of level of deadness. <laughs> Well, there's you know? also, you know, that reminds me of, again, the shamanic journey of being pulled apart, you mm -hmm. know, and then and reforming. Uh, so maybe he only did the first part of it. 
Well, I can tell you that certainly he was reformed after that. And, and I don't mean that necessarily to say that he became this incredibly religious guy, but he certainly uh, related that he was a very short tempered person, that he was uh, incredibly nasty to everybody and um, you know, had no patience with people and, and that sort of thing. And now he is a completely different person. Because he, he, in the way he says it, I don't want to see that place again. Uh, when I go, I want to, uh, I want to go to someplace else. Not, definitely not where I was before. So yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I don't know what to make of that. Certainly, there's that's not the only two variables in this equation. It's not only a heaven or hell situation. There's also muppets, as we've come to figure out. <laughs> well, there's also the Freaky Friday situation of. Trading bodies with another patient <laughs> as yeah. an outlier. Yeah, I would love to know what more of those outlier situations are because, of course, you know Jeff and I, uh, I believe that the outliers are important, and I think um, I don't I don't want to speak for you on this, but I think more times than not, that's where the important meat of the of the subject is is in the outliers, because. As we found with our own experiences, uh, we would be cast aside as outlier situations to, you know, the routine abduction scenario. Um, So I think the outlier stuff is rich with data, and I would love to know what all of that stuff is. Um, And the fact that there is outlier data at all, I mean, I think is amazing, you know. I guess I'm not I'm not sure where I where I fall into that. I I get what he's saying, like you have to sort of form a pattern to see if there is one or, or whatever. Find the pattern and follow it. Um, but when you're talking about an unknown, again, it's like something that, that by his own admission is not going to be figured out by science. So when you're dealing with a topic that will not be figured out by science, how do you create outlier data? What do you do with it? Well, I I mean, we were talking about the, um, the case of, you know, the freaky Friday, uh, swap bodies with the dead, that sort of thing. Um, if anybody gets a chance to catch it, it was on, I believe, Sci-Fi. They did a a special with guys named the Booth Brothers. There are a couple of brothers. I mean, and, and it, you'll have to ignore the. Uh, uh, there's a lot of leather and cowboy hats involved in this, but don't don't let that dissuade you. Uh, <laughs> they did a special on what was called the Watsika Wonder. Uh, this was 1878. A 14 year old girl named I think Laurency Venom. She moved into a place called the Roth home uh, for 100 days uh, with the claim that she was being possessed by the spirit of Mary Roth, which was the Roth daughter who had died 13 years earlier. If you get a chance to watch, this is really a well-documented case from way back when that will make your jaw hit the floor. I mean, I, I know how outrageous it sounds about switching bodies and that sort of thing, but um, this little girl – you know, didn't live anywhere near this place, you know, didn't, didn't know, uh, Mary Roth. And all of a sudden she comes out of this, uh, like coma like state and knows who, um, all of the Roth, you know, relatives are the mother, father referred to them as mother and father, um, knew the house. I mean, I mean, it's just, it's an unbelievable story to the point where Laurency went to live, with the Roths. <laughs> uh, and, I mean, it, it's an unbelievable story. Uh, you really have to catch it. I think that the documentary is called The Possessed. So if you see that come up on Sci-Fi, uh, DVR it or record it. It's really well worth watching. It's a, it's a damn good documentary. But, yeah, I found that, that whole thing to be uh, very reminiscent of, of that, which I'd heard before. It'd be nice just to be able to jump ship, wouldn't it? I mean, <laughs> then again, I'd probably wake up as you. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, I don't know if any of your family wants me to wake up as you. Boo. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, it, all in all, I mean, we, we've got to have uh, we've got to have Raymond back on the show again. I mean, he was a real pleasure to talk to and. Uh, and gave us a whole lot more time than, than he anticipated being on the show for. So we want to thank him very much for hanging out with us and spending the extra time. It was great. Yep, and we will have him back on probably sooner than later. I mean, it's kind of like, well, gee, 
why bother going anywhere else? This guy coined the term near death experience. He's right. done the most research of anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, who else are we going to get? <laughs> like, why would you go anywhere else? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that, that part of it, uh, that part of it's true. I mean, I think there are, well, I, I'll tell you, I think that, uh, I think that George Hansen, uh, you know, I, I think at some point we're going to have to have him back to talk about, uh, uh, psi experiments and, and experiences and all of that. I think all of that's going to tie in kind of nicely with this stuff and, and see where, where all of that takes us. But I think the near death stuff is, infinitely fascinating especially i i gotta be honest i mean i heard a lot of stuff in this episode that and it was the reason for my question of asking uh raymond about psychedelics and how much did he know about things like dmt and the pineal gland and all of that because god damn it sounds so tied into that you know and i'm uh I, i'm still trying to get through uh, uh a lot of books about the dmt studies and the lsd studies from way back when uh, you know, all of that stuff sounds incredibly fascinating to me. And the fact that, uh, uh, you know, if you read, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Strassman's book, uh, the stuff that he goes into about the whole pineal gland being the seat of the soul and X amount of days for the pineal gland to migrate from a certain spot on the fetus to the brain where it belongs – uh, is equal to the amount of days that uh, I think it was certain Buddhist sects believe that it takes the soul to enter the body, that sort of thing. All these really weird coincidences with that. And then looking at a psychedelic experience as opposed to a near-death experience, some of this stuff seems oddly, oddly familiar. So uh, maybe Terrence was right. Maybe, you know, maybe these compounds are allowing people to skip to the end of the movie, so to speak. Hmm. Or the end of a movie. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, I'm I'm still not convinced that, that even that is the end of the movie, even in terms of the stuff that I brought up before in previous episodes about first person, second person, third person relationship. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, the complete dissolving of the self led me to the big I am experience, right? Mm-hmm. So you have that experience. What does that mean in terms of dying and moving on as yourself? Um, into a realm in communion with, I guess, uh, God, Jesus, or whatever you perceive that to be, mm-hmm. um, and other dead people. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I wonder if there's still, you know, there's that level, sure, but then there's the next level, which is, no, you are that. Like, there still is that next level. I guess maybe I should have even asked Raymond about that, you know, explain to him what happened to me and, you know, where do you put that in this, you mm. know? Well, I, th- I, I, I think the one thing that I that I wanted to ask, but I just I was too uh, I was I was too concerned with trying to figure out where I'm going to put this mirror machine uh, <laughs> right next to your mummy. <laughs> yeah, right. well, he's up in the attic now. Um, uh, you know, I, I would like to know, you know, much like Terrence talks about, you know, how do you how do you qualify this experience as being an other? Uh, well, you get it to tell it something that you couldn't. You, you get it to tell you something you couldn't possibly know. And I'm curious how many people with experiences, you know, with the whole mirror setup, uh, you know, how many of those people actually came back with information that again they couldn't possibly have known. Well, I did ask him that, didn't I? Did and you? He said it was a really good pregnant question, and then oh, okay. I don't, I don't think he actually answered it. I think he- okay. If yeah, I, I mean, I'll have to go back and listen, but I know I don't. I don't think he did. I don't think he's, or if he did, I don't think he's. He mentioned anything that, you know, that qualifies as something he didn't know. I mean, for you, when you hear about sitting in the dark and being quiet in a dim, dimly lighted or very dimly lighted uh, environment like that, looking at essentially blackness, do you kind of see that as, um, I don't know less of a you know manifestation of phenomena or do you see it more as uh an inward journey of some sort sitting in the dark are you having an inward journey when what when i mean when the room becomes thick that sort yeah, of yeah when you're well when you're starting when you're using this uh you know the, the this whole mirror set up with the, the you know you're literally looking into a black Oh, I see. Um, well, I mean, yeah. is it any different than, um, like, you, you know, you would talk about looking at the wall and seeing the space between space? Right. 
Um, or like I'd say, you know, when my room becomes thick, if I'm meditating or just mm-hmm. resting, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, is that bringing, is that, be, this is the eternal question for us, right? Is that seeing more of what's in the environment or is that an environmental change or is it some interior thing being seen externally? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, but I, I would, you know, maybe it would be good for you to, to set up a psychomantium and, and all of that just to see what the difference is in quality, you know, if, if you do happen to see one of your grandparents, mm-hmm. as opposed to this being in the shroud or any of that abduction type stuff. Yeah. You know, is the onset different? Does it, f- because, you know, we talk about, um, this uh, phenomenon needing you to perceive it or it coming out and falling on the floor from within. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think the only way to know if this fits into that is to do it. To do it, yeah. Well, <laughs> as is with everything else. Um, but if yeah. you're asking me, I would say, yeah, I would say that that's the entire reason you can't just do it normally. And, uh, you know, you need to go through the, the motions of making the setup in the first place and um, deeply concentrating. In fact, I would think that the actual psychomantium probably isn't important. Mm. Uh, that that that's ritual. That this is sort of what we're getting into with magic, where it's like it's the ritual is superfluous. It's just showing your dedication it, it's and the, your yeah. singular focus. You know exactly, exactly. Setting all that up and make sure it's it's uh it, you know all of that is just showing the intent of what you're trying to accomplish, and so therefore you do. But that's my completely uneducated guess. So, <laughs> yeah, mine too. I mean, that's why I think you know. I, I, I'll tell you what I found interesting that he went to hug his grandmother, and she put her hands up and backed away. Did that not sound exactly like your abduction experience? Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, what? I mean, that's exactly that was. I almost brought it up, but I was like, well, that's another can of worms. Yeah, yeah. Well. You know, it's that... Um, but it is. It's the same can of worms. It's... It is, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's not about that. Don't touch me, for whatever reason. <laughs> uh, what do we hear from ghosts? You know, from ghost uh, accounts, ghost stories. What, what has a ghost ever told us? A ghost has never told us, I died and now I perceive this. And I... I mean, this doesn't happen. We don't hear what the ghost per- perception of its own surroundings are. And we don't hear, I don't remember how I died or any, I mean, th- I'm talking about directly from an apparition type of thing. Uh, and I think that, I mean, I, 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 I think it stands to reason that if you built uh, a psychomantium and you sat in front of it and you actually saw a dead relative, a dead president, whatever, and you ask them, what's on the other side? I think that they're just going to give you the same kind of answer that any being that isn't uh, in solid form is going to give you, which is going to be that shrug of, I don't know, or I can't tell you that, or uh, it's not for you to know, that sort of thing. I mean, you know, this seems to be like the big continuous thread through all this stuff is like there is something we are not allowed to know. And I've said before that, uh, you know, I think part of the function of the trickster is to, to protect that unknowable part of things. So I, I have to wonder if part of the reason she didn't back away and put her hands up was, you know, that would be giving away too much. That would be uh, taking too much. Uh, I don't know. But I found that I- incredibly interesting, uh, mm. at least in that sense. But, uh, yeah, we've, we've got to have him back on. Like, there's a billion more questions. I mean, a billion Um so we'll definitely uh, have him back on. Uh, so anyway, what's coming up? Next week will be uh, a twofer. We've got Carol Rainey and Dr. Tyler Kochjan. Excellent. I don't know that that's really how his last name is pronounced. I don't either. I, um, I'll ask him. Yes, that'd be good. Um, but uh, <laughs> they both, uh, as, as we all know, wrote the articles for Peritopia Quarterly that we put out with a free preview. And I just want to say, uh, in case it's not clear, that Jeff did the layout for the magazine. So any of the graphical stuff that you love, that you're like, oh, my God, that's eye-catching, blah, blah, blah. That's all Jeff Ritzman. <laughs> oh, great. And you did a great job. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so congratulations, thanks. sir. Well, thanks for um, all the editing and organization of writers and, and all of that. I mean, you know, that's uh, 
that's a huge task in and of itself. And I'm not even done the the uh, the full fledged magazine yet. We're still working on that, but uh, I hope it looks uh, equally as as uh, you know. Yeah. Equally as eye catching. If people like it, then great. I'll stick with that kind of look. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if people care how the magazine breaks down in terms of our creative input, but basically Jeff is the artist layout guy and I'm the uh editor. And well, I mean in this one I was the get people to write stuff, but I'm sure we'll both be doing that. Oh yeah. Um, but essentially, you know I edit the words, he edits the pics, he sings the songs that I write. <laughs> you are the moon, I am the sun. I don't know where we're going anymore. Well, we're both writing in it this time too, which is Yes. I think we're probably going to do for every issue is, you know, you'll have an opening and I'll have a closing and we'll go from there. But um but yeah, hopefully, I mean, um uh, for the next quarterly in futures uh, you know, hopefully we're able to bring the same level of uh, uh of writers to that and I think that uh, do the success of just the preview alone. Um, uh, I, I'm hopeful that uh, a lot of a lot more people are going to want to write about the more serious topics involving all this stuff. So yeah, and I'll have up. I mean, I'll I'll do this in the next I don't know week or so. But uh, some rules uh, for submitting because um, I you know we can't just do willy nilly. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's too taxing on on this guy right here. So uh, <laughs> I'll have some rules for uh, f- you know whatever writing. Yeah, yeah, and probably next issue we'll have um, we'll, we'll probably in the beginning parts of it have some kind of uh, of um, you know reader mail that sort of thing, reader feedback uh, in the beginning. So uh, if you guys have any feedback once the full fledged issue comes out, you know do write. Paratopia podcast at gmail.com and uh and we may end up including it in the next quarterly very good well i think that's it jeff it was lovely working with you once again yes yes you too i'd like to thank dr raymond moody for being our favoritist new guest yeah on this our hundredth episode and we will see you back here for the hundred and first wow yeah i know 101 <laughs> like the dalmatians that's 300 in dog ears. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. If you'd like to find out more about Dr. Raymond Moody, keep up with him, his TV appearances, radio appearances, what have you, uh, you can visit lifeafterlife.com. Once again, that is www.lifeafterlife.com. Take care. You don't understand. I'm out of here.